very fortunate to have my old neighbor uh, in, Coach Avery Johnson. Good morning, Coach. How are you? Avery. Hey, good morning, Wimp. Well, good morning, Barry. How are you, sir? I'm doing doing well. Um, I'm staying at home. Are you? All right. Good. <laughs> well, I want to thank you for being on. Uh, Avery and I became great friends, did a great job here. People forget now, Kyra Lewis. It was a lot of hard work by Avery and his staff, a lot of hard work by John Petty, a lot of hard work for Sexton. I mean, some outstanding basketball players that he brought to the university and did a good job with them. And uh, I appreciate you taking time to be on. And um, you're doing okay then? Yeah, doing well. Um, my wife and I, we relocated back to Dallas. And, um, you know, obviously we're in this COVID-19 um uh, situation all around the country uh, and 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 it's especially hit my hometown wimp and barry of new orleans yeah uh, where there's a high percentage of uh debt rate in new orleans especially with african americans so well, tell, uh, uh we've yeah. been, go ahead tell our listeners what you're doing I, I'm, I'm interested in your cbs stuff because you does such a great job on the television tell our listeners what you're doing yeah i'm, I'm with cbs sports network um, and CBS HQ, so it's two different platforms. But the Sports Network, uh, I covered about 20 games, uh, primarily in the American Athletic Conference. So I had University of Houston a couple of times, SMU. I uh, was able to go back to New Orleans and cover Tulane, uh, Wichita State, and then also um, quite a few games in the Mountain West. So I had a chance to cover teams like San Diego State, who was an outstanding team. I had yeah. them, I think, three times this past year. So that's that's when I'm actually calling games as an analyst uh, with a play-by-play guy. And then on the other side, CBS has a platform called HQ, which is their digital platform on all of your smart devices. It's a free download and a lot of work in studio with CBS HQ, and we're covering more NBA uh, or they'll set up a satellite in your home or laptop or Skype, and um, I'll talk more NBA on that platform, and that's what I did on last night after the last dance concluded. I had I was on CBS HQ on, on all of your digital devices. So I'm enjoying it. It's been a good transition. I've always been in the media in between coaching jobs, so uh, this has been a nice fit for me. Yeah, that's great. We're anxious to hear about Barry. So I want to ask you about this last, last dance thing, Barry. Uh, yeah, let's talk about that for a minute, Coach. Uh, it had me glued to the TVs. I made all my boys sit down and watch it uh, because they didn't really get to uh, experience uh, Michael Jordan. What, what, Avery, what makes Michael Jordan resonate? I see all these NBA guys tweeting out about it today. Uh, and last night, probably guys that really never even saw him play, uh, but he still is such an icon, even to those guys. What, what what makes this guy so special to people that probably ever, never even saw him? Well, I, I think first, the main thing, Barry, is you know, we're in an age where a lot of kids are, are, are into tennis. And, you know, his tennis are, you know, the Jordan are very popular. You know, you have kids that are at Adidas schools, uh, and even though they wear Adidas during their games, <laughs> the minute they step off the court, they're putting on Jordan. Yeah. And I think because of, you know, his global reach with his with his Jordan brand and tennis shoes and shirts and all the apparel, uh, that's where the connectivity is. Because of, you know, you have Twitter, Instagram, and all these different devices, you can go back and YouTube and watch a lot of Michael's games, you know, right in the in in your home. And I just think because of what he did and how he did it and the excitement and the winning the dunk contest, that resonates with a lot of kids. The flash and and, and the style. Um, I think another thing is his preparation. If that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, I remember playing against him in San Antonio, and you know, I got switched on him a couple of times, and he just shot right over me. But his level of difficulty to, to make the difficult shots was un, just unmatched. But then the next morning, he's up at 6 o'clock in the morning working on his game. 
Yeah. So I don't think he got enough credit for his work at. No. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I saw, Fran Fraschella, who I know lives out there in Dallas, he tweeted about, and I don't think kids do this now, uh, when he got cut in the 10th grade, I think he was 5'11 or whatever, you know, where guys now, if it doesn't go just the way they want, they're jumping to the transfer portal and, and looking for the first way out, where his mentality is, I'm going to go to work. Now, I know high school is different than college, but uh, you don't see guys with that mentality anymore, do you, Coach, where if something doesn't go, well, hey, I'm going to make it work where I am, and I, I'm going to be – I'm going to go to work and make it happen. I thought that was a good point by uh, Fran last night. Yeah, there is it's, it's kind of the product of the culture we live in. It doesn't mean it's necessarily one, you know, is better than the other. But uh, I was in a similar situation in high school where, you know, I was the 14th man on on my team, and and I didn't get any playing time. But I didn't pout. I was I went to work, and fortunately, uh, the whip. One of Wimp's best friends, who's a close friend of mine, uh, Tim Floyd, he helped me get to New Mexico Senior College. That was my only scholarship in 1983. Wow. Because he didn't think I was good enough to play at that point at UTEP, but he helped me get my only scholarship to New Mexico Senior College. And one thing led to another, and I eventually got transferred to Southern University. Uh, but again, I went to work, and it's all about work, and it's all about when nobody's around working on your name, and um, that's something Michael did, and it, and it paid off for him, and Scotty Pippen. Uh, yeah, that was uh, interesting to see. Kind of how you one more question uh, before I know Dad has a bunch, but uh, back then, and I don't know if you could do it now, if LeBron and went and played golf with Steph Curry a day off during a series. Everybody would go crazy. We talked about Danny Ainge and Jordan when the Bulls and the Celtics were playing. They went and played golf uh, on their day off. Uh, was that done a lot back then? And could they, could guys do that now, or would they just get crucified for it? Yeah, I think guys would get criticized now because if you do it now, then it's associated with you being soft or you're not focused. Uh, or you're too friendly with the with the opponents. But man, back then, there you know, I, I played 16 years in the league, and a lot of my time in the league uh, cross intersected with Michael. And I remember after games, we would go to dinner with the Bulls, and you know, the, if there was an off day, guys would play golf. Uh, guys would play golf during playoff series. Uh, you would actually go over to each other's home sometimes. Uh, but it never was perceived as being soft because, you know, you were going to take care of business on, on, on the court. But guys spent a lot of time together, worked an awful lot of together in Houston back then uh, with kind of the off-season home workout where you played in summer leagues and worked and trained together. So, uh, But Michael Jordan, whatever he did, transcended whatever you thought in a sense. If he wanted to do it, it was it was okay, um, and if he wanted to play golf with Danny Ainge uh, during the series, especially when he scored sixty three points on him, <laughs> it, it, it didn't seem like anything was wrong with it. Yeah, that. Uh, Avery, tell tell our listeners how hard it was because I went through with two other coaches. And I think we had good players. How hard it was and how hard you worked to get Sexton, to get Kyra Lewis, who wasn't sure about. Where you gonna get him or not? To get John Teddy, uh, to get these guys who two of them last year were terrific for Alabama. One of them's in the pros now. That sometimes I don't think people that listen to our show or when I was doing it appreciate or understand the, the toughness to go through to get. And let's admit it, it's in sort of a football atmosphere place when you you know like I had it, and you know it, it, it it's not easy, is it? No, it's not, but, you know, it's got to be a team effort. Um, you know, with the coaching staff, all the auxiliary staff, because when, when the kids, first of all, it's very difficult to get them on campus uh, because, you know, you're not Duke or, or North Carolina uh, because of all of the perceptions. So my, my first thought was, well, if, if Alabama's going to hire an NBA coach coach, um, with my background, then they're really, really serious about recruiting NBA level talent. So that was kind of my pitch in the staff. Uh, pitch was, hey, you come to Alabama, 
you don't have a chance to go to the NBA because that's what all of the kids want to do. So I think once uh, we got them on campus, then we were able to show them what a special place Alabama was and that we had all the resources and the university administration was going to make a commitment to helping grow uh, the, the basketball. And, and that's what we did. And we were able to get some talented kids, but uh, it was a lot of hard work, uh, which is no problem because I'm, I've been a hard worker my entire life. But I just think collectively it was all hands on deck from academics, compliance, uh, training staff, uh, just and just showing what a beautiful place Tuscaloosa was, which a lot of people didn't know that Tuscaloosa has a lake. And it's just, it was uh, the way we had a chance to display uh, where we were going with the program and the vision that we had. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a lot of hard work, but it was well worth it. Well, you're not giving yourself enough credit, and I won't get in an argument with you about that on, on radio, but, but you're not giving yourself enough credit. I'll give it to you anyway. Um, Tim Floyd had a hard time. I really haven't talked to Tim. Tim and I are very close. Um, Scott, my middle boy, play, works for him. Um, but I'm not sure it's a, it's a whole lot of stuff he really wants to talk about trying to take over for the, for the Bulls. That was a very... You know, naturally, if you're in college and want to get into the pros, you want that chance, maybe money-wise. But uh, that was not an easy task, was it? No, and and a lot of times in situations like that, um, you want to you want to take over the second time around, not necessarily the first time. When you take over situations, well, when you have such a legendary coach like. Bill Jackson and you had Michael Jordan and, and, and Scotty Pippen and that run of talent and all of the role players they had. Even one of my teammates, Steve Kerr, who was very instrumental in terms of his role for the, for the team. And I played with Dennis Rodman for a year in San Antonio. We actually traded Dennis to Chicago for Will Purdue. And we dismantle that team and then you walk into a situation where they won six championships in eight years. And it's, the team is just decimated, and now you're drafting a bunch of young players. Man, it's, it's kind of like a no-win situation. So sometimes, you know, with the deal that Tim walked in the door, you don't necessarily want to walk in. At that point, you want to walk in after that guy. Uh, it's the same situation. Look at Greg Popovich, the run that he's had in San Antonio, in a, in a market, smaller market like San Antonio. San Antonio has just been remarkable. But the guy that takes over for Greg Popovich, you know, he's not going to have Tim Duncan or Tony Parker or Manu Ginobili or David Robinson. Uh, so it'll be pretty interesting once they get in transition uh, of, you know, when Popovich decides to retire. So Tim walked into a tough situation, but he's a good man. He's been a good friend uh, to me since 1983 and uh, very well respected as a coach. Uh, we're talking with Coach Avery Johnson. Uh, Coach, three guys you recruited here, uh, both put their, all three put their names in the draft just to to get find out where they are, get the feedback. It's going to be difficult with this uh, COVID nineteen going on to get a true uh, read on where they are. There's a lot of people saying, "Ah, Kyra Lewis is gone." That speed potential, uh, but the other two guys, they think Herb will come back, but John Petty's kind of uh, fluctuating on what to do there. Some mock drafts have him drafted. Some of them have not been not getting drafted. Uh, it's difficult for these guys, right, to get a true read on what the NBA guys think because they can't go work out for them. What would be your advice to these guys? Yeah, it is a little bit difficult in, 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 because a lot of times, you know, you can go to the Chicago pre-draft camp and that's a time where you can work out if you want to participate on the court, especially if you're a fringe guy or a second-round guy, um, and that gives teams a chance to interview you. But it's also... Uh, the workouts at you know at the prospective team sites at their all of their practice facilities where they bring you in. Maybe they'll bring you in by yourself, or bring you in with another guy. Uh, could play one on one or two on two, or just work out for the team individually, and then they can sit down and have lunch with you and, and talk to you. Uh, if you have some sort of injury history, they could get an idea of you know where you are physically, uh, but. But now it's a lot of pressure on those uh, NBA scouts to see who's really been doing their homework because those guys travel all around the country to games and have to 
evaluate talent. So I, I, I think my whole thought in terms of advice for players that have played for me at Alabama, is if you're guaranteed a first-round pick, if you're guaranteed to go in the first round, I think you know that's a no-brainer. We don't want to hold you back. I think that's good for you, and it's good for the university, it's good for your family. Uh, but if you're not in the first round and guaranteed the first round, um, then you probably should con- really consider coming back and get better in the off and improve your draft stock. So that's that's always kind of how we get by when I was at Alabama. Yeah, uh, good advice there. We'll we'll see as this thing uh, happens. Uh, a guy like Herb Jones, uh, you know. I was going to ask you, did you ever sign a guy or play with a guy in the NBA? And when they got there, you were like, wow, uh, this guy's even better than I thought. I think those guys talked about it when Jordan got to North Carolina. Any guys stick out in your mind that when you played with him or you coached him, you got him and said, wow, he's even better than I thought he was? Wow. Well, when I look back on, on, on my career, um, I remember a guy that you guys know very well, my first in the NBA, uh, he obviously was already on the team. But um, when I had a chance to play with Derek McKee, I was thinking, man, this guy's really good. <laughs> you know, he's 16, oh, Mississippi country boy from Alabama. And actually, Derek McKee uh, was the first guy to introduce me to the university in 1989. I went to my first football game at Alabama and uh, uh, had a chance to eat some good Alabama food, but I was really blown away with his size, the way he could handle the ball, pass the basketball. Uh, so I would say, you know, Derek is one of the guys that stood out. But as a coach, we, dra- we drafted a kid when I was coaching the Mavericks out of Wisconsin, Devin Harris, who was just unbelievably, uh, uh, he, had, he was a fast guy, uh, fast than Tony Parker. I hadn't seen a guy that fast with the ball since Tony Parker or a guy that I played against in Kevin Johnson. So I would say Derek McKee and Devin Harris are two of the guys that stand out. Yeah, Derek McKee is a guy you don't really appreciate him unless you really know basketball. This guy's unbelievable uh, when he played. There was nothing uh, he couldn't do, Dad. Okay, tell us about uh, Avery Jr., how he's doing. Oh, Avery Jr. is doing well. He lives, um, he lives in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, Avery Jr. has been one of those kids uh, because of all of his relationships and contacts through the AAU circuit and I'm in college. And, and because of my years, all of my years at NCAA, he just built a large network of friends that he's doing some business with uh, on the NBA level and some NFL guys. So he's headed down that road, went from Barry, where he essentially has his own sports and and our marketing agency, and he's doing extremely well. And my daughter still works on uh, Wall Street for uh, BlackRock Investments, and um, she, she's doing she's doing well. Also, she got accepted to uh, Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern, so she'll start at Northwestern. Hopefully, if everything gets back to normal, she'll start at Northwestern at their business school in August. Coach, what does Miss Cassandra have on your honeydew list today? Is she making you do a bunch of work around there right now? Well, no, uh, Miss Cassandra has on my honeydew list that I got to work out on this Peloton bike. This oh, Peloton you got a Peloton? You, you got a Peloton? Yeah, I have a, uh, yeah. All right, I'm going to look so you I up. Gotta, I got one. I'm going to ride with you one day. <laughs> yeah, look me up, and uh, I got to get a, my workout on the Peloton 30 minutes because she's always on my app making sure that I'm working out and burning some calories and uh <laughs> so you know, so and, but the great thing is barry she's an incredible cook so i get some i get some uh, uh awesome dinners at night kind of new orleans style so Hey, well. you guys need to say a prayer for miss terry can you imagine coach saving at home all this time coach no i, I can't <laughs> and, and knowing coach saving and getting to know him when i was at alabama uh, I know this has been a really difficult time for him, and and uh, but I, I know once the players get back, boy, watch out. Woo! We're gonna you give know. it to him. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think he's gonna tell, give it to him. Tell our listeners before you leave: Would you like to get back in coaching if the right situation came about? Would you like to go pro, college, or what? Well, I think it's pro more college. Uh, you know, even now, Wilson Barry, what I'm doing covering, you know, 
basketball, college basketball. I get a chance to talk to so many college coaches. Sure. And attend practices and shoot around. So just this time I spent at Alabama and this off season of just seeing coaches do it a little bit different and getting a lot of different ideas. I kind of wish I would have done this before I took a college job. So this is uh, gives me more opportunities, more options like the college or pro. Uh, you look at look at Coach Anthony Grant, who I took over for. He went to NCAA for a couple of years, and, and man, I had Dayton this year when they played St. Bonaventure, and he's talking about a team with Final Four potential. Oh, man, he, does, he did an amazing job there and had some really, really good players who um, who played at a high level. So you just keep your options open and uh, you don't close any doors. And um, I had a really good experience at Alabama, and um, and I know they, the program, I think, is heading in the right direction. I, from what I've read, they got some really good players coming in to go with some players that are returning. But uh, that's a really good job. And uh, if they can get the um, Coleman Coliseum situation figured out in the future and re- reduce the seating capacity and make it a little bit more of an intimate environment, I think that's going to help the program tremendously. We sure want to thank you for being on, Avery. I appreciate it. Appreciate your friendship. And if I can help you in a way, give me a holler. Thanks, Coach. Okay. Appreciate All right. you. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Okay. Take care. All right.